Welcome to the iLearn Virtual Campus. Please sign up for a free iLearn membership on our website, check out our 7th Annual Conference coming next spring 2021, and let us know if you're interested in hosting events or leasing space on our campus by emailing campus at immersivelrn.org. That's brief. I'm going to call Professor Guzrum to start the introduction, okay? So, uh, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure and a great honor here today with this last note in our last day of Eismer. I have the pleasure to introduce you Professor Gudrun Klinker. She's going to be the master of ceremony of this session and Professor Ramesh Hazar, which is going to play the, the keynote for us. So enjoy. See you later. Hello, everybody. And also welcome from my part to a great Ismar that we have enjoyed so far. Great honor to me to now introduce Ramesh Raskar for the keynote speech this for me evening, maybe for you afternoon. Uh, I've known Ramesh since uh, quite a long time. He's really one of the pioneers of ISMA, EVA, uh, uh, and ISMA uh, in, in its whole merger. He has been working at UNC with Henry Fuchs and uh, Greg Welch and others on things like the Office of the Future and has been presenting spatial AR, which now is a big thing, ever since the 1990s to us in ever-changing concepts and wonderful ideas and presentations. So. From there, he has then continued on to Mitsubishi Research Lab after finishing with his PhD. By now, he is a professor at MIT Media Lab. He has also broadened his uh, uh, research interests from spatial AR out to computational imaging and photo photography, computational health, and has also is very well known for his femto camera and femto photography. He has received a large number of awards like the Globus Indus Techno, Techno, Technovator Award, the TR100, DARPA Young Faculty Award, Alfred Sloan Research Fellowship, Lemelson MIT Prize, and recently also the SIGGRAPH Achievement Award. And um, somehow it's not on my list, but he also received, uh, no, okay, yes. He has received a large number of awards and I don't want to take too much of the time and I'm really looking forward to a great presentation by Ramesh. Hello everyone. Hello. This is Ramesh Raskar at MIT. Uh, and Hello, everyone. This is Ramesh Raskar at MIT. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about augmenting health solutions patient to population scale using augmented reality, AI, and sensors. Now, everybody knows about this movie, right? This is Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Now, what you'll notice here uh, is that Tom Cruise is very explicitly interacting with the screen, right? Uh, he know he has to think about the file servers. His gestures are, are very specific to move a file from one place to another, use his gestures to make changes to the file and so on. So he's thinking like, you know, a, a, a file system, how to interact with it, 
and, and manipulate with that. If you compare that with a movie that came about 10 years later, the movie Her, uh, uh, Theo in this case has very implicit interaction with the world. You know, he just has, you know, headphones, he has Interaction in monetary and the implicit interaction uh, in the movie. Okay. Her. And how does that relate to augmented and virtual reality? In today's world, they are more like Tom Cruise than Theo uh, in how we're interacting in this augmented and virtual environments. Let's take another common example. You know, if you use Waze or Google Maps, uh, you know, uh, it allows us to understand uh, where how should you go from point A to point B? Uh, not because you have somehow, somehow have a smarter um, car or you have you know, a smart city system. It's only because Google sucks up the location of all of our, uh, all of our GPS locations from the cars uh, and it can very quickly show uh, where everybody else is and show the traffic uh, and show you know, that you should take one street or other by showing this greens and reds uh, on the screen. It allows you to get around because we know everybody who's ahead of us, how they're behaving and what challenges they're facing. So let's see how this maps to uh, augmenting surgeons uh, and in health systems. Uh, imagine a future where surgeons can have this multimodal interaction. Some of that is based on you know, head-worn devices, as you see here in drawn in, in purple. Some of it is on you know, traditional screens in the back, LCD screens, as you can see. You can dial in a nurse, which is shown here in the pink, uh, and they have all these tools. And you also notice that the room doesn't have very complicated you know, other setups. Uh, everything is set up in, in the ceiling. The ceiling is made up of cameras and projectors and multispectral light sources. Uh, and it's kind of all been removed, all the clutter of lights and interactions have been cluttered. So the surgeons can really focus on what they have to do. In addition, they can see options uh, of what exactly the surgery would look like. Should I take option A or option B or option C? So what does this, what does this future look like? We, in any AR or VR systems, we have to think about three sub-problems. How do you capture, how do you analyze, and how do you interact? And just like Waze, uh, you know, we can, the surgeons could have information of millions of other surgeries that have been done before them, bring those surgeries video in, and create a library of complications. In case of Waze, it's a library of uh, traffic jams, it's a library of com uh, complications. And then analyze, using computer vision and machine learning, natural language processing, tips, anomalies, and so on. And then finally, you can interact with it with augmented reality, haptics, you know, multimodal screens, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's not just about augmenting what you're doing, but also understanding how the surgeons themselves, you know, how their brain activity, their eye, voices, context and action can be understood uh, as well. So this neurocognition uh, assessment is very important and virtual and augmented reality uh, is playing a key role. Uh, here's, I'm just showing an example from a company, React Neuro, where I'm an advisor. Uh, and so augmented reality is not just for seeing what's out there, but it's also a way to understand what's going on for the surgeons themselves and understanding their neurocognition as well. 
So in that sense, virtual and augmented reality is not a display device, but it's also a capture device because the sensors and cameras and, and gyros that are in the head-mounted device is also capturing information about the person who's wearing it. Uh, and one, would, one could argue companies like Google and Facebook, uh, you know, make billions of dollars, not because they're using browser as a display medium for showing the content, but most of the information they capture are they're treating browser as a capture medium. You know, which click, links you have clicked, how long you have hovered, you know, how you have liked particular things. And they're using browser as an input to understand the user and then sell them services and show them ads and so on. So we're also going to go through this very interesting shift in, in VR and AR, where the device is not a display device, but it's actually a capture device, in this case, for neurocognition assessment. So when you think about augmented surgeon beyond the X-ray vision using this multimode AR, so on the left, you have the traditional mindset of a, there's a head-worn device and you go to see some kind of an X-ray vision. On the right, is the notion of a multimodal interaction. Uh, in this case, with projectors. And my PhD thesis, you know, almost 20 years ago, uh, was about using projectors for augmented reality. So we have to get away from this obsession that augmentation can only happen with head-worn devices. In reality, it's going to be multimodal. So when you think of augmented reality, you think about the world, you're going to uh, input it, and we're going to sense beyond human ability. Uh, and then we're going to abstract and present within the human comprehensibility back to the world. And that's our mental model of how augmented reality works. Um, and for input, we're going to use cameras and location and sensors. For processing, we're going to identify, track, you know, make it more abstract. And then finally, for output, we have displays and overlay. And all of this is through interaction. Now, currently, when we talk about an AR and VR, we are obsessed with the display aspect of it. And as I said earlier, it's just not just about the display. And even within display, they're obsessed with resolution, field of view, frame rate, optics, and so on. And what we're trying to do is we know that none of these parameters are actually going to allow us to create you know, the perception, the, you know, a photorealistic perception of what's out there. Uh, because the physics is just not our friend when it comes to all the physical parameters. So we're looking for those dips in the perception and see how our physics of our devices can just slightly overcome that so we can create a, a meaningful perception. And this is, to me, is very frustrating. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was doing my PhD in North Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, in AR and VR, you know, I, I got into the field because of Jurassic Park. Like, wow, if we can augment the virtual uh, the scenes with virtual dinosaurs, you know, you can probably do a lot of other things. Uh, and then near the end of my PhD, I, you know, I started watching South Park and I just completely changed because if you think about South Park versus Jurassic Park, I mean, South Park, there are no photorealism, the shadows are not right, the shapes are not right, the motion is not right. But one could argue that South Park is much more enjoyable, much more interesting than Jurassic Park, right? And so that's the struggle we have, that it's not always about photorealism, but it's also about functional realism. It's about the storytelling aspect of it as well. And that's why some of the research I did later on is not focusing on photorealism, but so-called functional realism. In this case, a non-photorealistic camera that can directly create something that's more comprehensible uh, and more easy to understand. So this notion of realism, which is non-visual, which is going to be just storytelling, functional, which could be this cartoon representation, photoreal, and physical realism. And I know we have been obsessed with this top right part of it, uh, but Jim Forward and others have been talking about this distinction between different types of realism. And should AR and VR focus on photorealism and above or below uh, is, is an open question. And the reason why functional realism hasn't taken off is the neuroscience of what it means to be together and be there 
you know, is, is pretty archaic. Uh, in our experience, we have seen most of the research in neuroscience is based on, uh, you know, some specific assumptions of what it means to be there. Uh, and there are very few data sets that allows us to do this research uh, as well. So going back to how surgeons work, as you'll see from this picture, is extremely multimodal in terms of the devices they use, in terms of the displays they use, in terms of the other uh, you know, sensor inputs they have, is extremely multi-format and multimodal. And it will be a mistake to make VR and AR using a simple mode, which is some kind of a head-worn solution. And in addition, the ecosystem of, of, uh, of AR and VR requires integration with IoT devices, you know, thinking about the ergonomics and hygiene, have a gesture language and so on. So there are many aspects to make AR and, and VR right. So again, beyond the input and output, uh, we have to worry about authoring, data sets, IoT, multimodal, multi-format gesture languages, you know, ethics, even how do you deal with people who are wearing eyeglasses, right? Uh, and so throughout my research, uh, you know, I've been working in many of these areas. Uh, as you know, I took a sabbatical leave and I was at Oculus uh, as, as a lead architect. And one of the points I con constantly made was that let's get into a multimodal, multi-format world out there. So multimodal AR, uh, when you want to augment a real object, you have many options, you know, something that can be done, you know, very close to your eyes, uh, something at arm's length, something far away in the room, or in some case, you know, uh, for the object directly. Uh, and this could be retinal display, head mounted display, handheld display, or spatial see through display, or what we call shader lamps, you know, that comes directly on top of this object. So we wrote a book on uh, spatial augmented reality uh, with Oliver Bimber that many, many of you may have read, but that part of, was part of my PhD thesis about 22 years ago. And when you think about augmentation, one of the great examples is the vein viewer, where you know here I am, uh, you know, able to just put my hand underneath this vein viewer, which has a coaxial IR camera that can see my veins, but has a projector that's projecting on my hand in a green color. So it becomes very easy for you know a, a nurse to find the vein and uh, for for injections and, and and so on. And this notion of shader lamps, which are lamps, which are projectors that are providing shading information. Uh, and with that, you can do a lot. You can create virtual motion, uh, you can create interactions, virtual reflectance, virtual illumination. On the top right, you have a, 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 you know, a neutral colored white model of, of Taj Mahal, uh, but by using projectors, you're able to add texture to it uh, and create illusions of illumination change and motions and vibrations uh, and all of those things. Uh, so the multimodal aspect of augmented reality uh, is very critical. And the other way to think about this, you know, some of my colleagues uh, here, uh, Rob and, and, and Ben and Bill, often remind us that people are lazy. You know, as much as it looks cool that Tom Cruise is standing in front of this big screen in Minority Report to move these things, you know, that's, that's have a huge cognitive load of keeping in mind where everything is and also physical exertion. And if there's fatigue, people are not going to use those interactions and AR VR systems. So we have to keep in mind that people are lazy and create solutions that are more like the movie Her and Theo that have very implicit, implicit uh, interactions. So what does it mean to create base for surgeons? Uh, you know, there's decision-making, there's sharing tips, there's training, there's finding anomalies, so let's dig deeper, a little bit deeper uh, into this. So first of all, as I said, you can step back and add these projectors and cameras in the ceiling that are constantly scanning the world in real time, augmenting it. And the augmentation can come through the projectors, through the head-worn displays, or through the screens that, that are already uh, in the room. Right? Uh, and as I said earlier, the capture, analysis, and interaction uh, in, 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 these, in these setups uh, become the key problem uh, for us to solve. So let's look at some of this problem. So as I said, AR and VR is not just about display, it's about capture. And I would argue that capture is a much bigger opportunity 
and display. So we should start obsessing about field of view resolution and frame rate and so on. And also uh, artificial intelligence is very different from intelligence amplification. And intelligence amplification will beat AI at any moment because in intelligent amplific intelligence amplification, it's the synergy, the symbiosis between the human brain and the computer brain. So let's think about these three buckets, capture, analyze, and interact. And any digital system over time goes through three phases, improve, transform, and disrupt. So in the beginning, you can imagine that such AR systems like Waze for Surgeons uh, on capture, you know, you have video and haptics and on-site diagnostic tests using AR. In terms of analyze, it's sharing tips with other surgeons, you know, avoiding waiting uh, and so on. And in terms of interaction, uh, you know, we can train doctors, you know, very rapidly. You know, some surgeons can become Olympians and become very smart or one senior surgeon can manage a team of other surgeons without being there physically. Uh, but over time, we're going to transform the field of surgery as well in terms of capture. We'll capture the library of complications millions of surgeons have done before. Analyze, we can find the anomalies early and also predict what could happen after the surgery is done uh, and interact with the surgery, not just with the scalpels and the tools, but also with speech. And then some interaction, you know, we might be able to handle comorbidities uh, that, uh, that's what makes the surgeon's job very difficult because, you know, as they're doing the surgery, they have to have a knowledge of what potential complications could be, what are some comorbidities for this individual, but while interacting with this, you know, augmentation of multimodal augmentation. And then that's what we need a display and haptics. But how are we going to really disrupt the field of surgery through AR and VR. So let's take a step back and think about different types of omics. You know, there's expososome, there's epigenome, there's the microbiome, there's metabolome, there's proteome, there's transcriptome, and genome. You know most of this, but there's a new one, anatome, which is about the anatomy. It's about the structure, the function, the development, the evolution, and network of different bodily parts. And if you can create an anatom, then that would start, this is a, a dictionary that allows us to represent anatomy by structure, function, development, and evolution. And that's what would allow surgeons to see through a, a, an augmentation device and detect the anatom so any of the other interactions uh, can be done. So if you had the anatom, uh, you know, recorded at cellular level or a, a, or a mesoscopic level, then we can start capturing in real time during the surgery and before, you know, the cellular level multispectral understanding of those anatomical parts. You can have a remote capture or a distant capture. You don't have to write in contact with it. In terms of analysis, we can do population health uh, analysis across the surgical patients. Uh, and we can see when a surgeon is working on one particular patient, how the patient compares with millions of other patients that have been already analyzed before, um, and, uh, and and sliced by, you know, uh, demography, age, ethnicity, and so on. And then when we have this anatomical structure library, this dictionary of anatoms, that will become, you know, the fundamental building block for how AR interacts with surgery. And then in terms of interaction, it also becomes a precision health. It's a guided option, as you saw in the cartoon earlier, which is in real time, we can provide the feedback to the surgeon of what the next step should be. And this is like the ways for surgeons, which is instead of taking the traditional route, you know, ways might in indicate to you that you should take this detour because there could be a complication if you take the traditional route. And this is the kind of guidance, you know, surgeons would benefit from. And of course, you know, surgeons have to spend, you know, thousands of hours to become a, an expert at a particular surgery. But if you have these type of ways for surgeons, it's like going into a new town uh, and not knowing any of the streets, but just a Google map or ways allows you to navigate through that town. Same thing 
surgeons should be able, able to do novel surgeries without significant training. You know, they, they may be able to just do this training in, in simulation and then go in the wild and be able to directly work on, on a patient. So it's definitely reduce the amount of special training required for this, which means in developing countries, in resource constraint conditions, you know, we can get surgeons and medical professionals up and running very quickly, although most of the training is actually happening in simulation and extremely low cost. So just to tell you a little bit about my own group uh, at MIT, uh, our motto is to make the invisible visible um, inside our bodies, around us, and beyond. And we also think about capture, analysis, and interaction uh, for us. Um, so in terms of capture, we're building a new type of a tricorder where we can look under the skin, uh, maybe at five to 10 micrometer resolution. This is a large project with NSF or create new types of endoscopes uh, that can create cellular level, uh, cellular resolution imaging, or we're building cameras that can see around corners uh, beyond line of sight. In analysis, we're creating new types of machine learning, which we call auto ML, uh, that can make invisible visible, privacy preserving machine learning that can make invisible data visible, uh, and many aspects of machine learning and computer vision and motion tracking. And then finally, in terms of interaction, uh, some of you might know the work from Matt Hirsch uh, from our group, where you have eight deep telehealth and haptics, which is uh, you might be able to create a screen for remote uh, you know, uh, uh, health analysis where the, the, the doctor can look at the patient, not just by, not just by you know, changing their viewpoint, uh, but literally shining a light and the light would shine on the patient on the other side. And they can zoom in and shine light. And that's why it's eight dimensional because you have two dimensions of screen, two dimensions of being able to uh, change your viewpoint, but you also have additional four dimensions for the light itself. Uh, and so this eight dimensional light field, if you can capture and display, then telehealth can be transformed uh, dramatically. I want to thank uh, my group members at MIT from the Camera Culture Group. I want to thank my collaborators at Stanford University, uh, Lee Sanders and Carla Pugh, uh, and also my collaborators at Harvard, Raj Gupta, and from Singularity, Dan Kraft, uh, and many folks who have helped me uh, think through these ideas for augmentation for, for surgeons, as well as my colleagues from Mitsubishi Electric, who worked with me for Shared Lamps, uh, and of course, my team from my PhD thesis uh, at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. Now, some of you might say, we understand why intelligence amplification is more important than artificial intelligence, but what if we don't need the symbiosis between human machines? What if there is a robot that can do everything? A robot can do actuation and can do, use AI to do full-fledged surgeries. And clearly you're a fan of Prometheus, the movie, where as you can see on the bottom right, you know, a robot can do a full-fledged surgery. Well, we are very far away from getting there. I think we are very far away from even changing the way surgeons uh, do their surgeries right now because I can't imagine a system in the near future, next five or 10 years, where we can replace you know, the very skilled hands uh, of surgeons. So at this stage, it's more about augmentation and it's not about you know, robotic surgeries like, like, uh, like Prometheus. So to conclude, uh, we think we need artificial, so we need augmented reality for intelligence amplification, AR for IA. And that's how we're gonna go from patient scale, how surgeons are interacting with one patient at a time to a population scale that they understand millions of other surgeries that have been done before, and they can interact with either one patient or multiple patients at the same time patient scale and population scale. And for that, we need not just augmentation of the world, but we also need the neurocognition of how the doctors are thinking and even possibly how, how patients are thinking. We want to augment the surgeons, and I use this analogy of ways for surgeons that they would allow them to share tips, you know, dramatically simplify training, find anomalies, and you really want to build technology that gets you in and out of OR in the shortest possible way. 
And then I talked about this idea of precision health versus population health for surgery. If you create these new structures, these new dictionaries called anatom for human anatomy that can have a library of structure, function, development, and evolution that will allow surgeons to predict complications and handle comorbidities in real time. It's very much like you see those Hollywood movies, uh, you know, when the, where the lead character has say, should I cut the red wire or should I cut, you know, the green wire? Uh, <laughs> and imagine if you had experiences that are streamed in from billions of surgeons before, uh, you know, we can imagine that surgeons, surgeons can start doing even novel surgeries without significant special training. Um, so I think we have a glorious decade ahead for AR and for VR, but I hope we'll stop obsessing with head-worn uh, limitations of augmented reality. I hope we'll go beyond displays and start thinking about many of these devices as capture solutions. And although I have used the example of surgeons for augmented reality, this is one of the most complex tasks. This little, we're little talking about life and death uh, challenges here uh, in terms of using technology uh, in this situation. So if you can use that mental model of how can we create AR for surgeons, you know, every other problem is probably going to be much simpler than that. Thank you very much. Ramesh for this very visionary and interesting presentation on uh, augmented reality and intelligence amplification and or artificial intelligence and all of this combined in multimodal uh, presentation schemes. Uh, I have to check, do we have already a question? Not, I would like to ask maybe a very general and philosophical or general question first. Uh, you, you say that with uh, AR, we can provide, um, go from patient skill to population skill. Yet, I wonder, uh, there is a lot about the communication channel that needs to be established between the computer and the human, and you have to have the same language. And AR has to have the right level of abstraction in order uh, for the, the doctor to understand quickly. Doctor has to be well trained. So I, I'm not sure whether it's so easy to provide these kinds of skills to any uh, uh, untrained novice. Uh, there would be too much communication that needs to be provided through AR. That also, or do you have suggestions how to quickly uh, convey the message to somebody who has uh, little in information about medicine? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. I think it's not it's not that easy to to you know go from a, a untrained you know medical professional to a surgeon. So that's not what we're saying. Uh, I think we're saying if you're already a surgeon uh, and and you know you don't have as a, as much experience dealing with a particular surgery, maybe it used to take you you know twenty surgeries to become an assistant to you know a head surgeon. Now you could get away with one or two because there's so much simulation you would do. And you know, there was a time when to fly aircraft, pilots would have to fly real aircrafts and risk their lives. And of course, now pilots use you know, flight simulators. Uh, nevertheless, they still have to sit next to somebody who knows how to fly, fly airplanes and take turns. And only after a certain number of hours, they can start flying you know, airplanes on their own. It's the same thing with surgeons. It's just that we don't have as many tools for surgeons to do that simulation. Now we do have surgical simulators, but the surgical simulators are like Microsoft Windows. It's like, you know, Tom Cruise in Minority Report. And what we need is ability to take all that intelligence from millions of surgeries that have been done before to be able to use for a given person at a given time. That's where you have this notion of population health and precision health simultaneously, right information at the right time for a given surgeon. 
so the communication level is also very important sort of our uh, we have to have some uh, standards there how to convey information visualization sort of is important some questions exactly. are coming in uh, uh, so there is one by daniel Perasso. great presentation do you see any application using ar for surgeries during the pandemic <laughs> And that's, you know, it, it, we are in such a crisis. Actually, I have a whole new project uh, spun out of MIT called pathcheck.org. You should check it out, P-A-T-H-check.org, P-A-T-H-C-H-E-C-K.org. Uh, and, you know, it's one of the largest nonprofit open source project for COVID-19. Uh, and we are already in several US states and many countries. So we're already doing a lot of work in COVID-19, but by using smartphone apps, uh, and one big challenge in COVID-19 in, uh, from, from AR and uh, AI point of view is that, you know, if you think about chest X-rays, which are good indicators for, you know, if you have a COVID pneumonia or some other benign pneumonia, <clears throat> you know, we just don't have enough chest X-rays being shared. You know, about 2 million plus people have been hospitalized over the last year, but the largest data sets only have about 10,000 or 20,000 chest X-rays. And so that's a big problem. So how do you even get this data of 2 million chest x-rays so that you can look at this one chest x-ray and certainly it becomes you know easy to to diagnose um, uh, you know whether it has covid-19 or not so and that's the whole point of augmented reality and virtual reality we, are, we have been so obsessed with the display quality um, that uh, you know we need to start solving everything else and focus in the beginning let's say for the next 5 years focus on the functional realism not as much on photorealism and solve all these other problems of intelligence amplification, IoT, uh, you know, how to make the device a capture device, not a display device. We have to solve all these sub-problems for the next five years uh, and worry less about the display quality. There's another question by Mario Lawrence. How do you see VR surgical training simulators integrating into your vision of AR surgical training? Yeah, so that's a great that's a great question. So as you know, surgical simulators are completely synthetic. You know, you're, you're not taking a real world real world data set. So an awesome idea, maybe a, in, you know a, a PhD thesis or a startup or even a big research center, is to create surgical simulators that are based on videos that are already out there, as opposed to simulators that work on synthetic 3D data. So I, I totally agree. I think there's a lot of potential to combine the two. Another question by Steve Feiner. To IA, intelligence amplification, thought about biomechanical augmentation. Perhaps in contrast to the assisted teleoperation of systems such as the Da Vinci, maybe something more like an intelligent exoskeleton for the surgeon's hands. Great to have maybe four hands that way. And de definitely, maybe, maybe intelligence amplification uh, is you know, only what we see in, in AR, which is kind of your cognitive uh, augmentation, uh, but intelligence amplification does not limit to cognitive limit. It doesn't mean we limit to cognitive augmentation but could be physical augmentation as well. So with Da Vinci, it's about scale, uh, but it could be about speed. It could be about, you know, uh, you know, completely different. Uh, I like, I like uh, um, uh, Steve's suggestion on thinking of this an exoskeleton, kind of extension, physical extension of your, of your body. So as long as you can solve intelligence uh, in terms of, you know, cognitive, as well as, um, um, as uh, as uh, um, preproceptive, uh, I think that's you know if you can solve those two things, you know kind of bits and and bytes, um, uh, sorry bits and atoms, uh, you can do a, you can do a pretty good job. If you can manipulate both, uh, then you can do you can do a good job. So it's not just software, but also the robotics aspect of it. It's a great yeah. it's, a, it's a great idea, and I hope you know in five years from now, in ten years from now, from in Ismar. Most of the papers are about, you know, different types of intelligence augmentations that include software augmentation as well as robotic augmentations. Yeah, I very much agree with that also. There's another question by Haruo Takemura. Thank you for the great talk. What kind of computational complexity 
barriers and challenges do you think exist to realize intelligence amplification for surgery? Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if you think about autocomplete in Google search bar, you know, it's doing a lot of queries. It's really trying to predict what the next word could be, you know, based on millions of other queries people have done. So if you type Joe, the next word might be Biden, right? But that's easy. But what if it's something really obscure? You say, you know, Ramesh Raskar paper on, and you start seeing all the papers that I have written. That's kind of amazing if you think about autocomplete. And what we're talking about, uh, you know, IA here, uh, intelligent amplification is really that autocomplete feature of it. Like, can you tell me what are my options going forward? In, in case of surgeons, maybe like the three options, uh, but there could be many more options. So computationally, let's think about autocomplete as a starting point. If you know what auto draw from Microsoft, which is start drawing a diagram, like a, maybe a dog. And the moment you draw a circle, it starts projecting many kinds of animals as possible completions of the drawing. Uh, and then as you get closer to a dog, it starts showing dog in multiple cartoon, uh, you know, uh, um, multiple cartoon poses. And as you start drawing the dog more and more, it starts suggesting more colors. So it's also find of kind of an autocomplete for drawing. So I would say kind of Google search engine, Google search bar is kind of for 1D autocomplete, auto draw is like kind of a 2D autocomplete. And what you're talking about today is kind of a 3D autocomplete. Um, so computationally, you know, I think capture, analyze, and act. I think the capture is difficult alone. Like, how do you even capture the video from the viewpoint of the surgeon? Because there may be videos, but they may be recorded from a third-person view, not from the doctor's view. So just capturing alone is not trivial. But let's say we solve that. Then how do you analyze and create new types of data structures so that if you have millions of videos and you want to bring this information in real time to to the user? You know how do you how do you solve that using you know computer vision, machine learning, NLP, uh, and so on. And then finally, how do you provide that user interface to the surgeon so that the right information shows up at the right time without you know a significant uh, cognitive load? Because you know we saw Tom Cruise versus Theo. I mean Theo is lazy in the movie Her. He doesn't want to move his hands. He doesn't want to do anything at all. He just goes goes by his life, uh, and and uh, you know with his earphones and his phone and just his regular computer, and all the intelligence comes to him at the right time at the right place, even when he goes on a date. You know, you know the, the intelligence system is telling him what he should say to, say to the woman. And I think the same challenge we have for intelligence augmentation. So computationally, it's a non-trivial problem for capture, analyze, and act. Uh, but I think you know, we are all heading to a singularity anyway. Uh, I think these are the kind of problems we should be solving. It should not be big. In, in other words, it should not be as big a barrier as we think today. In in a five years from now, this will be common sense, commonly available. Okay, hey, uh, questions keep pouring in, so I'll give. I'll well, we'll be plugging along, and I'll read out the next one by Corey Ilo. How would you go about registering these augmentations to a patient? Surgery is a very precise task. If a surgeon is following a ghost surgeon similar to ways. I would expect the goals to be fairly accurate. Otherwise, otherwise patients are liable to be hurt by these potential inaccuracy. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, that's kind of the bread and butter of augmented reality, you know. During my PhD thesis in augmented reality, registration, 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 and latency and swimming, you know, this is kind of a bread and butter. Uh, and, you know, it has to be solved. Uh, but again, I think in, in constrained scenarios, like being inside, you know, being inside a uh, an operation theater, uh, you know, you could you could add more things. You could add a sprinkled, fluor, uh, you know, fluor, uh, fluorophore material <clears throat> on the on the patient. So it provides enough texture and so on. So there are many things you can do to improve the ability to register and so on. And of course, the recent advances in computer vision, machine learning, have really taken the notion of registration very far. I mean, if you use you know Instagram or or you know, any of these apps with real-time 3D uh, superposition, they look really, really good, even if there's no texture. Um, and so, you know, I think by solving this global to local, local to global problem, uh, we can do registration. So I'm, I'm less concerned about the registration itself, and I'm more concerned about, can we give options to the surgeon in, in real time uh, in, a, in a UX that's, that's actually meaningful? 
I think that's a bigger challenge. Um, I'm less concerned about registration, uh, just kind of thinking ahead. Still, we are to solve it. Okay, great. Uh, Cameron Trax asks, in your opinion, what sort of shift is it going to take before we uh, get a globally unified spatial web that functions as ubiquitously as the World Wide Web? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, if you talk to Richard, Richard Newcomb, uh, you know, at Oculus Reality Labs, you know, uh, I forget the name of the project now, uh, and you know, they have this ambition to create, you know, uh, a, a special semantic web. And as you know, I was at Oculus and spent a lot of time with Richard. So some amazing work is going on in that space. And if you think about even the original uh, Google Street View, um, how do we get that down to every millimeter at every millisecond uh, is, is, is going to be very exciting. But I don't think we're that far away because the business, the, the commercial and market forces that are driving the need to create near real-time high-quality 3D maps of the world are, 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 are immense. You know, whether it's self-driving cars that are zipping through or you want to create analytics for <clears throat> all kind of you know, spatial uh, information that's out there, or the fact that you know we're going to have thousands of satellites, whether Skyweb or Elon Musk's satellites that are flying, you know, in low Earth orbit, um, uh, in Leo, uh, to take pictures of Earth, uh, you know, almost you know every second uh, of any part of the Earth. Uh, I mean, these are just amazing. That you know, we'll soon might have drones, or you know, if you're a fan of Big Hero Six, the movie, you know, you have these balloons that are being used for you know, harnessing wind power, but there also are sensors looking down on Earth. So you're going to get this, you know, a network, you know, kind of internet of cameras, internet of sensors uh, that's constantly capturing the, you know, the spatial information uh, about the world. Uh, and again, as I said, it's not going to be driven purely by augmented reality, virtual reality applications, but it'll be driven by all these other industries as well. Um, so again, I think I think that's so. On one hand, we will start creating 3D maps that are very rich of you know, pretty much every meter, square meter of Earth that of interest in real time. On the other hand, the capture devices, you know, the future AR, VR devices or smart glasses, you know, I'm more gung-ho on smart glasses than AR, VR right now, but any of these devices that are close to your body are also going to become capture devices. I keep harnessing on this, hammering on this point. These are capture devices, not display devices, because they can have a neurocognitive understanding of what you're doing. And the combination of those two maps, the map of the world and the map of each user and their emotions and their, their neurocognitive status, when you put that together, then we're going to see the next Google, the next Facebook in the world of AR and VR. Uh, two more questions lined up. Uh, William Bernstein asks, how has the Open Biomedical Ontology Foundry changed the game for IA, oh, IA for surgery? Sorry. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the work in ontology uh, has been mind blowing since the 90s. And, and a lot of our colleagues you know, at Stanford are, are you know, very well known for making breakthroughs in ontology. Some of this is a lot of grant work but in a lot of bioinformatics intelligence has gone into it. So it's very fantastic work. Nevertheless, you know, it's kind of a structured way from the structured web to the unstructured web. Uh, and there's some really great breakthroughs in bioinformatics where you don't even need this hierarchical structured uh, information of ontologists. On the other hand, if you think about omics, you know, omics can deal with a lot of mess, you know? So if you have a, you know, genomics, of course it requires very structured information. Uh, but if you think about other types of like proteomics or the ex example I proposed, which is an idea of an anatome. Uh, so when I work with my colleagues at Stanford on anatome, you know, the fact that you have different body shapes, you know, your liver, your heart, you know, a particular, you know, all the way from a cellular level to, you know, anatomical level, uh, those anatomes are actually going to be the building blocks as opposed to, you know, hierarchical ontologies. So that's kind of an exciting world as well, which is, you know, right now, you know, with many camera apps, you can aim your camera at an object and it can do object recognition, right? I mean, this is something, when I was in grad school, building an object recognition, uh, you know, uh, algorithm or a live demo was out of question. 
uh, and now we have that in consumer apps. I think the same thing with Anatom as well. Like right now we think, wow, we have to think about all this bioinformatics information, understand how the human anatomy works, uh, human biology works, and just to work together. But very soon we'll be in a space where, you know, real time as a surgeon is looking at something, they will have an understanding of the anatome, which is a structure, revolution, network, and hierarchy, and so on. Uh, and they'll be able to use the anatome directly for, for many of these operations. And just to be sure, as I said in my talk, the notion of surgeons is, is just, a, just a way to push the ideas in AR and VR and AI and sensors. It's obvious that those ideas can be used in other settings as well, whether it's you know, in factories or entertainment you know, or any of the you know, other applications that we think about uh, for AR and VR. I intentionally chose the surgery scenario because that's what I'm working on, but also because it pushes those concepts to something that's literally, you know, life and death issue. Daniel Ross has a question to which maybe uh, will help people, I think, understand more how to prioritize their own work. So he asks, what percentage do you personally work on improving the present and past by innovative but applicable technologies? And to what percentage do you strive for the radically new or visionary? Day only has 24 hours. <laughs> That's, that's a good question. Depends on where you are. If you're at a university, uh, I have a whole talk, by the way, on uh, how to pick the right ideas to work on. So feel free to ping me or, or look at my LinkedIn page or my Facebook page um, on, uh, on how to pick an idea. I mean, I personally am a professor, but you know, I also work in, in big corporations like, like Facebook and, and Apple and so on. Uh, I also have many startups I have founded uh, and also you know, run nonprofits. So in each of those areas, of course, what you do is different. I would say in a university, you know, whether you work on something that's extremely radical and, and you know, futuristic, or you work on something that's incremental, the amount of work you have to do is the same. So why not just do something crazy and radical and ambitious? You know, because the amount of work you have to do and how hard you have to work is the same. So let's just do something radical and, and forward looking. But when it comes to in a corporate setting or a, or a startup, then you know you live your life by quarter by quarter, or maybe you know one funding round to the next funding round, and then you better be sure that what you want, what you're building, is useful within the next year, uh, and then you would worry about the current constraints. If you work in an R&D lab, which is in between a university and a corporation or, or startup, then maybe you have a slightly longer horizon, maybe it's three years to five years, uh, and you know, when I was an architect at Oculus, you know, some of the biggest conversations I had were about, uh, about all the envelopes, because, you know, you can go to Qualcomm and look at the trajectory of the chips. You know, you can go to, you know, optics foundries and look at the size, weight, and performance parameters, and you can literally project them on a trajectory over the next five years. So if you're building a product, unless you're releasing it, you know, in 2023 from now, you already know what the specs for your product are going to be. You know, Qualcomm is not going to come up magically or Intel magically a new chip for that, you know, for that power and other constraints to give you more compute than what they're promising in 2023. So you can do all those calculations in advance to decide how hard you should push the innovation. But when it comes to a university setting, let's just do something radical. So we have to wrap this up now. Uh, I'm extremely thrilled uh, by this wonderful discussion and the first the presentation you gave and it, it I have posed so many questions and interesting visions of the future. Thank you for this great keynote speech. Uh, I really enjoyed it and everybody did. Thank and you. the rest, so further questions, yeah, further questions can be asked on Hoover and I hope you will be able to answer them there.
Yeah, or just or just send me an email or on my LinkedIn page. Welcome to Welcome the iLearn virtual, virtual, virtual Campus. Please sign up for a free iLearn membership on our website, check out our 7th annual conference coming next spring 2021, and let us know if you're interested in hosting events or leasing space on our campus by emailing campus at immersivelrn.org.